Uh, I'm Srini. I'm from NADAP, um, India. And uh, I gave a similar talk at SDC, SDC India. It was pretty well received. And uh, I also gave a talk at uh, SDC US last year on Erasure Codes. That was interesting too. Uh, when, I, when I talk about this particular space on encrypted search, I kind of say this message at the end, but I thought I'll say that at the beginning so that it will keep the audience interesting, which is just the four of you. <laughs> but still, <laughs> uh, so the, uh, the thing is, um, not, it's not just me. People who work in the space kind of believe that this is a, a deal breaker because this is uh, something as this can create a revolution as big as public key cryptography, because uh, the space uh, the deal this, this this deals with is about you move the data to cloud, okay? You encrypt your data, and you may have to read the data back for what to do some computation on it, okay? And you encrypt the data for privacy, right? You wanted to keep it private. You don't want to give away what your data contains to the cloud service provider. But now, if I give you an opportunity or an option to actually have the data encrypted and still do some computation on top of it, why not, right? So who wouldn't use that? So this area kind of explores that thing. So uh, so it's, it's not an oxymoron anymore where we encrypt the data and we we are not in a position to actually use that data. I mean, essentially, you encrypt the data, it becomes a blob of data and you can't do anything with it. But this space actually talks about algorithms and approaches where you encrypt the data and you can still do something on top of it, like search, okay? And in this particular talk, I'm gonna talk about database search only, okay? So that's a pretty well-explored area for about 10 or 15 years now, and uh, it's pretty mature as well uh, to have a, a nice conversation around this. No, we do not have a product which uh, does encrypted search. None of the companies have. Um, AWS, as far as I, I, I know, AWS recently came up with a uh, uh, AWS service called encrypted querying, but uh, that's not what I'm talking about. That's a, a naive way of doing what you can do. The pioneers in the space is Microsoft, I must admit that. So as your uh, fo folks in Microsoft Research, they work on those encrypted uh, search uh, uh, algorithms. But none of it is in product. It's not in Azure as a, as a cloud service or anything yet, but they are still in algorithm phase and they're still figuring out how to get that productized. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna uh, uh, outline my talk like this. I'm, I'm gonna give a brief survey of how, what existing technologies look like right now. Uh, simple homomorphic encryption 101. I don't expect you to know anything about what's encryption at all. Don't, don't worry, it's not gonna be Greek and Latin. It's not gonna be heavy mathematics. Um, I'll delve into what's encrypted search. Uh, why is it a deal breaker? Why can it be a deal breaker, let's say, five years from now? And then I'll talk about what's called trade-offs, which is the, the important caveat behind encrypted search, and then give you some examples for encrypted databases. <clears throat> um, so there are several non-cryptographic methods of dealing with encrypted search. That is, you, you have your data encrypted, you can still do some computation on top of it, but you don't need all these complex mathematics, complex mathematics, which is in the form of cryptographic algorithms. So things like what's called as differential privacy, like uh, you want to perform some uh, computation on a data that you've encrypted and stored in cloud. Now, how do I make sure that the cloud service provider, who's probably honest, but he's curious, okay? So he, it, it's a threat model where we deal with data storage being a honest but curious uh, provider. So he, he doesn't have the intention to look into your data, but there is probably a rogue storage admin, or there's probably a hacker sitting inside who's looking into your data. So how do I protect from him, okay, uh, him or her? So this differential privacy essentially adds a little bit of noise to it, so that when you have to decrypt it, it's only you who will be able to decrypt it. It's like this initialization vector that you add in encryption algorithms, if, you, if, if I may use. So, you, I mean, I'm gonna talk about initialization vectors, but essentially it's about just adding noise. Then there is this data anonymization, like if you've heard of all these DLP uh, uh, stuff, data leakage prevention, when you, uh, let's assume you have a PDF file and you have some sensitive information in it, like your social security number or a credit card number or something, and when you move the data out of the, your, your on-premises data center to a cloud, what we essentially do is scan your PDF files, look for the sensitive data, I have a 16-digit number, which also matches my pattern of, uh, my regex pattern of being a credit card number. What I'll do is I'll just change that with hashes or Xs, or I'll just anonymize the data in a form 
so that a, an external person will not be able to m understand what is in it. But when the data comes back to me through the exchange server, my exchange server is actually going to talk to this anonymization algorithm and re re return that back to the actual value that I, that I used. Okay, so that's the anonymization. So you, you kind of mask your sensitive data with uh, a, an insensitive gibberish data. And then there's another technique where you can fragment your data. Now, what if I have, uh, let's say, one, uh, a, a gigabyte worth of file, but I store 200 MB of it in Azure, 200 MB of it is in AWS, 200 MB of it in somewhere else. Okay, now, if I have to read back the entire data, I'll have to put all of these together. But as such, the 200 MB of data sitting in Azure makes no sense to, to, to Microsoft or anyone who's got hold of that data. Okay, so that's data fragmentation. Typically, people use techniques like erasure codes, where we can split uh, data into smaller fragments, add a bit of parity for the sake of uh, data loss, and you want to reconstruct it back. So that's fragmentation. So these are techniques which obviously do not use any cryptography in it. There are some techniques which is based on secret sharing. Um, so secret sharing is something where uh, we have a secret, but it's a collaborative way by way of which you'll have to understand the, uh, the output. Like, like, let, let's say there is a database sitting in AWS. Now, I have some key, if I do not give the key uh, to AWS, they will not be able to, uh, to handle the query, execute the query, and get me the result back. Okay, so that's a secret sharing where I have a part of the data here. Imagine you go to a locker, a bank locker. You have a key, and the banker holds a key. Okay, you go together, you put both the keys inside the locker, turn it on, and then the, the locker opens. So if the banker is holding only his key, that's not going to work, or if I go with my key, that's not going to work. That's, that's secret sharing. Okay, so you have parts of keys and parts of data sitting here and there, and you kind of work together to, to get something out of uh, the actual data. Uh, so there's one, more, there's one specific way of secret sharing called as order preserving, where you retain the, retain the order of the data. Let's say, for example, age. Um, we're, we're talking about medical health rec records and stuff like that, where you have age stored in a column in a database. Now, if you wanted to see uh, order by a specific, uh, so you have a, a long query order by age, now you, you need a specific order. But now I've encrypted my data, so will I be able to calculate order? Obviously no, because it's a blob of data. But there are encryption schemes where you can actually retain the order of the encrypted data. You can still be able to uh, find out, uh, you can run range scans where I can say age greater than 50, uh, who, are, who are all the people. So it may not be stored as 50 as such, but there'll be an equivalent to 50 and I'll be able to get the records back. But unless and otherwise I give the key, I'll not be able to understand what exactly is the, is the value returned. So as a, as a cloud service provider, they'll not be able to look into what the actual data is. That's order preserving. And there are some index-based schemes. The most promising and the most interesting of all is searchable uh, index-based uh, uh, encryption. I'll, I'll talk about it after a while. So order preserving is pretty much what I just uh, told you before. Okay, so uh, uh, there are some algorithmic way, the cryptographic way of dealing with this, and these are the most promising ones where... Uh, 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 like the, the question that somebody asked, where Microsoft Research is working on specifically these algorithms, trying to get as much as IP as, as possible in the space so that nobody else can step, step over. So functional encryption is essentially something like this. You have data, you encrypt it using a specific way, and I'll give you a key where the key will be able to do only one thing and not more than that. Okay, so I've encrypted my data, and you'll be able to run a rain scan. Okay, this key will help you run only rain scan and not anything more. You'll not even be able to know if the data is so and so. Okay, if it's even an age, is it even greater than 50? What are you talking about? I don't, I don't have any idea. But if I give that key to you, and that key will help you run only that rain scan of age greater than 50. Okay, so imagine a situation, I'm a client, I have a gateway, a gateway or a proxy, and this proxy is talking to a key manager, and the key manager is having a bunch of keys for your data. Now, I run a, a, a select statement where I say age greater than 50. Now my proxy is actually looking at, the, at your query and says, okay, he asks for age greater than 50, which means that he's running a range scan, he's, you need an order preserving encryption algorithm, which means I'll pick that particular key and send it to, to AWS so that AWS can run that query, give me the result back. Okay, the, the key is, is it can only do order preservation, can only do rain scans. So you, AWS runs your rain scan, gives back encrypted results. So AWS doesn't know what the actual data is, or what the actual result is. Your proxy decrypts that data back to you and gives it back to the client. 
So this proxy and key manager sits right there at the periphery, and it doesn't give you away give away the key to the cloud service provider, but it kind of acts transparently in the middle. So that's functional encryption where you'll be able to do just that one operation, that one function that you really want to do. Searchable encryption is a little bit more complicated. Now imagine I have data organized in some fashion, let's say in some file system, and I have some data structures on top of it for indexing. Okay, let's say I have an index based on B3 or something like that. Now, what if I can have an encrypted B3? Okay, so I'll, I can still do all my indexing, all the all, all sorts of performance optimization and fast fast lookups and things like that. But that data structure, as such, doesn't make sense even if I lose it because it's encrypted. And what if I extend that one more step further and say that my data is encrypted and so is my uh, is my index? Okay, so that's that's what is searchable encryption. So I personally have implemented the searchable encryption in an Elasticsearch system. So Elasticsearch, essentially, we know about it. It kind of takes a lot of data and then it indexes, creates uh, invertible indices and all, so that search becomes easy. Elasticsearch, right? So it's a it's a um, it's a a distributed system where you can feed in a lot of data and you can just index it and you can quickly search on imagine small google for your own infrastructure so you can just search on data inverted indices essentially so i have a, a book and i want to look for a particular keyword let's say cryptography and where is cryptography in that book i don't want to go look up all the pages i go to the back i search the index see oh page number 20 40 and 60 has the word cryptography so i go to page number 24 so essentially elastic search does that now what if my uh, inverted index itself is encrypted so if i'm searching for the keyword cryptography i do a one way encryption which means that the cryptography matches to some abcd in encrypted format in ciphertext format i'm going to search for abcd in the index I'm going to look up ABCD in page 20, 20, 40, and 60, but essentially when I decrypt my page using my own key, I'll have my data in plain text. So That's searchable encryption. So in this case, the indexing is not done by the AWS? Yeah, so we do it in plain text and then feed it back to that. That's right. That, that's a good catch, but yeah. <laughs> essentially, once you encrypt it, you cannot index it. What's the point of indexing there? Like, because when I'm going to search for that keyword called cryptography, I'm searching it in plain text. I do not know what it maps, maps to in ciphertext at all. That's right. That's a good catch, yes. I'm sorry, I just somehow trouble to come in. So you uh, store the data, you, you encrypt it, even index one. Who encrypts it? You do it or Amazon do it? So, uh, so the, the, the system that I implemented, the Elasticsearch system implements it. But I provide the key. I do the key management. I see. Yeah. OK, so that's the second one. And that's probably the most promising of the lot. Uh, the third one is secure multi-party comput computation. So imagine the, 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 the case that I mentioned before where you've just fragmented your data. Your, half of your data is sitting in AWS and half of your data is sitting in Azure. So you want to put these together to actually make some results out of what, what you've stored. So that is secure multi-party computation. You give a, a piece of work to AWS, a piece of work to uh, Azure, uh, and then you get stuff done. But to, without putting them together, you really don't make sense out of it. Okay, let's say Hadoop. I have a, a Hadoop cluster spread across AWS and Azure. Now I have some MapReduce jobs running in AWS, some MapReduce jobs running in Azure. But as such, they don't make sense. Okay, but putting together, that's that's my actual result. Okay, and that is what imagine Trump runs a poll, and now. Uh, just the data sitting in AWS doesn't make sense because what what's the count? That's probably half of it or maybe 20% of it because I've spread my data across. So putting together, that's what I'm, I'm interested in. So that's secure multi-party com computation. And homomorphic crypto systems, I'm sure, is beaten to death already, but I'm going to talk about that only. So the, 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 the problem with homomorphic crypto systems is that people assume or uh, people kind of imagine homomorphic crypto systems as these all or nothing where uh, you can do everything in the encrypted space. So homomorphic encryption systems for, just to, re just to uh, make sure that we are all speaking the same frequency, um, homomorphic crypto systems are systems where you encrypt the data and you'll be able to perform computation on that encrypted data equivalent to what you would do on a plain text data. Okay, so if you were to, let's say, add two numbers, one plus two in the plain text space, I know my result is going to be three. But if I want to do it in the ciphertext space, one got encrypted to some A, 
2 got encrypted to B. Now, if I want to add A plus B, I want to get C. Okay, so, but the problem is A and B are not integers anymore, right? I need to come up with an operator which is equivalent to plus in the ciphertext space. Okay, an operator like a, 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 an addition or multiplication and things like that. I, I have that operator operate on these two operands, which essentially is A and B, and my result will be C. Okay, now if I decrypt back the C, I should get 3 which is supposed to be the answer in my plain text space. But I can do any sort of computation like that on the ciphertext space. That's homomorphic encryption. Now, the, the word any qualifies it to be called as a fully homomorphic encryption where you can do any, any operation on the ciphertext space. You can, so essentially, they say, if you can do addition and multiplication, you can do anything because it's like NAND. So you can do anything uh, on top of it. You can just, it just becomes more complicated, but you can construct any huge computation and break it down into additions and multiplications. So that's fully homomorphic. But partial is something where you cannot do any computation, but there are specific things that this algorithm supports and you'll be able to do. And that is the more interesting space. And that's what I'm going to talk about in this rest of the talk. Okay. And the state of the art systems, because all of these are algorithms, all of these are encryption stuff. What can we use as systems practitioners? This is not interesting to me. What can I consume? Is there a library available? Can I just put it in a system? Are there systems implemented? Uh, what scale have they been implemented? So this is that. So there are, uh, after like about a year and a half, uh, a year, a year and a half of studying the space and working in these technologies, I came to know that, I, I mean, I kind of realized that there are only three ways of getting this done. Only three ways of getting this done. The first thing is you need some sort of homomorphism. That is, your data is encrypted. It's sitting in an untrusted environment. And uh, uh, you enable that untrusted environment to perform some computation using some form of homomorphic encryption algorithm. So the data resides there. It stays encrypted. You perform computation on encrypted data. That's the first one. The second one is you have some sort of a client server split. So you have a client who's trusted, you have a server who's un untrusted. Now the client kind of comes up with a mechanism which says that, hey server, you have this job to be done on your data, but pass me the results. I need to do something on top of it to get the actual results out. Okay, so it is kind of a coordination between a client and a server. The server does part of the work, the client does the rest of the work so that you can get the results out. That's the second type. And the third type is, okay, this, this computing on encrypted data is not working. What we can do is, let's move all the encrypted data to a trusted place, like Intel SGX, Intel TPM, TXT, all of these trusted platforms that, uh, that these vendors offer. So you move the encrypted data to, a, data to a trusted domain, and then kind of decrypt it, perform the computation, discard it, discard the encrypted data. That's the third way. So these are the only three ways that I figured that People, I mean, we, we can classify all these systems together. So there are some example systems. You can go back and look into them. I'm going to talk about CryptDB and Monomy uh, after a while. But, but these are the grand classes of systems that are available. OK, 101 homomorphic encryption. So I don't expect you to know anything about encryption at all, because I'm talking in a storage conference. I realize that. Uh, so. So what's symmetric encryption? What's S I'm, I'm going to run through all of these. I don't want to spend a lot of time, but I want to get you on board to homomorphic so that we can have a, a meaningful conversation. So you have some data. You want to encrypt it. You get some gibberish data you, which, on which you can't do any computation on top. That's the problem today. So I, I have a key which is passed on to the encryption algorithm, which is probably the user secret. The, the key is supposed to be the user secret. And you have some uh, ciphertext. You give the same ciphertext to the decryption algorithm, which is inverse of the encryption algorithm. Unless otherwise the key matches, you don't get the, uh, the, the plain text back. That's basics. Okay. Small change, instead of, instead of using the same key for encryption and decryption, if you use two different keys, one called as a public key for encryption and a private key for decryption, that's called as asymmetric encryption. Examples, RSA, all the certificates, HTTPS, everything works on this. Okay. Uh, okay, so specifics. Now, it just doesn't stop with just a key and the plain text. There's something called as a mode of encryption, how you actually encrypt it. So we're talking about AES is the most, pos most popular standard for uh, symmetric encryption, where you use the same key both in encryption and decryption. And in AES, there is a specific mode called as CBC, which expands the cipher blockchaining mode. That's not, that's not required, but the way it works is 
along with the key, which we just discussed about, there is also what's called as an initialization vector, which I just mentioned some time back, but let's go to the specifics. Now, uh, I take, I take a, a long, uh, a, a huge data, I split them into blocks. So these are called as block encryption schemes because they split them into blocks and they work on each block at a time. Uh, you have one block, you have the key, but you also XOR the block with the initialization vector, vector which is a random number. And this initialization vector changes over cycles. The next round you go, your initialization vector changes. Okay? And the key is also passed. So now you have two non-deterministic stuff. There is one key, which is user secret, and there is also an initialization vector. You put them together and then you get the results back. Now imagine the key changes. This is not going to be the same. If the initialization vector changes, that's not going to be the same either. Okay? So that's the logic. So I change the initialization vector to something, the data completely is different. Okay, um, so variable initialization vector. There is this scheme called as a non-deterministic encryption. Okay, so what's so what's the what's the big thing? Forget about all of these. So if I have a data and I encrypt it with a key, imagine there is no initialization vector. I get some ciphertext. Now, if I have the same data, I give the same key. I'll keep getting the same ciphertext. Okay, imagine there's no no initialization vector. That's important because now. Let's, take, let's, let's talk storage terms. Let's talk deduplication. What are we talking about? Deduplication is you're looking for some patterns in your data. Okay? Now I take a block. Let's take a block. I just encrypted with a key, encrypted file system. I encrypted with a key. I don't have any initialization vector. But the result is always going to be the same, which means that even if on the encrypted space, my block is going to look the same, which means I can do deduplication of that data. Essentially, if you encrypt your data, you can't do deduplication because you're not going to get any deduplication ratio at all, right? Or, or compression for that matter. Any storage efficiency, we're gone. But if I don't have an initialization vector, I can have the same data coming in again for the same plain text, which means I can deduplicate all these duplicate ciphertext blocks, right? Which is pretty straightforward. But is that good security? From security standpoint, it's not a good one because if you switch off initialization vector, there's another random thing which you just removed. Okay, it's not secure, but but there is a standard AES mode called as AES ECB mode. Yeah, so, uh, so let me skip this. Yeah, AES ECB mode where you just have key. There's no initialization vector, which means I keep getting the same data again and again for a given key, which means you can do deduplication. Okay, and there is a a big scheme of uh, um, you know, deduplication techniques using what's called as convergent encryption. It's a it's a pretty big thing in, in, in at least storage efficiency world where you support encryption and deduplication together, which is supposed to be like, I don't know, you can't do it, right? So, so that's AES ECB mode, and it's a standard mode. It's NIST standard, FIPS standard. It's, it's not like we're, we're smoking crack here, okay? You can, you can use this, <laughs> and, and customers will buy your product. Uh, but it's not the, sec the most secure way. So if you were to use the non-deterministic mode, which is using CBC, that's gone. So it, I use the same data. I encrypt using probably the same key. Just because I use different initialization vector, I'll have different data, which means that I can't do deduplication. But that's good security. Okay, This is good security, but it's not good for storage efficiency. So these are two classes of uh, encryption algorithms. One is the non-deterministic encryption, which is safe and secure, but it's also screwing up our storage efficiency business. But the other deterministic, which will get you all these equality checks, okay? That equality checking is important because it's not just deduplication, it's going to be useful in all the databases as well. Okay, so let's go to, the, yeah, you got the deterministic part. So I, I, told, I spoke to you about uh, the AES uh, ECB mode. So I spoke to you about e AES CBC mode, which is non-deterministic. You give the same plain text, same key, you will get different ciphertext. This is deterministic mode. You give the same plain text, same key, you get the same ciphertext where you can do deduplication and comparisons and things like that. And there's one more called as AES's FFX mode. It's expanded as uh, format preserving encryption. It preserves a format in your ciphertext. It's not equal, but it preserves some format that you want to pick. Okay. So for example, in this one, what's called as an order preserving encryption, if I have a value which in increasing order, I'll also have an encrypted data in increasing order but not essentially, essentially the same, which means that if I have encrypted data, I will not be able to know if it maps to one or two or three, but if I have to run greater than three or greater than four or something like a range scan, I'll be able to do that, 
Okay, a range query is possible, but you will not know what, what exactly is the data. You will get your results, of course. So how many people in the room are aged more than 40? Okay, I'll get, the, I'll, I'll get to know the number, but I don't know if that was 40 or 30 or 50. Okay, so that's, that's the key here. So it's, it's pretty useful, but uh, it's not secure again. You, you still leak some amount of information about the data, right? Okay, so going to one level up, the homomorphic encryption. So I, I, I gave you a gist. So you have two data, both encrypted, and you perform some operation, okay? That's, a, that's not the usual plus. That's an encrypted version of plus, which is not necessarily addition in its original form. It's some encrypted form of addition, and you get your result. Okay, now the idea is if you decrypt that back using your proper uh, private key, you will be getting what you would have gotten if you had done the same operation of addition on plain text. Which means that I don't have to decrypt all my data in order to just do that little computation. Okay, we're talking gigabytes and terabytes of data sitting in, in, in cloud and you want to perform uh, such computation by downloading all of it to an on-premises data center and then doing that little computation and discarding all of it. If you can just do that addition there, I don't have, to, I mean, I save on all these network costs and everything, okay? So that's homomorphic encryption. But the spectrum is, the, the one that I told you about deterministic encryption, which is on the right side, uh, so that one, which can do equality checks, okay? That's also homomorphic encryption, okay? People kind of think that homomorphic encryption is you can do anything. So these are called as partial homomorphic schemes, while that is called as a fully homomorphic scheme, as I told you, which can do any function. So deterministic encryption does equality, it enables you to do equality checks on the ciphertext space. And order preserving, you can do range scans as I told you, you can do less than or equal to, greater than and things like that. And there are schemes like Paleo cryptosystem and Elgamal, Elg Elgamal is pretty popular, where it can do only one operation, not all of it. This can do addition, that can do multiplication, and not more than that, okay? So these are still homomorphic encryption schemes, okay? But what is called as partial homomorphic encryption. Okay, the other one is fully homomorphic, which where you can do anything. All of this is covered in it. But the problem is, this fully homomorphic encryption was invented or coined, or it's not coined by the way, it's invented, or the first ever fully homomorphic encryption algorithm came out in 2009 as a PhD thesis uh, from Stanford. Uh, but till date, that particular algorithm or the scheme I mean, it's, it's been implemented. It's been implemented in a, in a library. It's available on GitHub. Uh, it's called as HELib. He stands for homomorphic encryption. You can download it. You can play around. But the problem is it's not uh, optimal. It's not practically useful from the amount of computational resources it takes to encrypt and decrypt, uh, CPU, CPU cycles, and also the amount of storage it requires to store encrypted data. That is, when I tried my hands on it, a 1KB file when encrypted came to tens of MBs, a 1KB file. That was kind of impractical. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Is it the same? Data same? I, I have some numbers for you uh, for the fully homomorphic encryption. So this one is kind of impractical still. Okay, the first one is kind of impractical. It's, it's, I mean, of course it gives you all the bells and whistles that you want, but it's impractical because of all the performance and practical reasons. These are practical. The green ones are practical. Of course, you can do non-deterministic encryption where the AES CBC mode can give you the best security that you want, but you can do nothing with it. I mean, your data is pretty much useless. But there are these order preserving and deterministic encryption where you can do some operations on it. It's practical, but uh, it's not as functional as possible, but it also leaks a little bit of security. It gives away some information that you probably don't want to. And there are these practical, some partial homomorphic schemes which does addition and multiplication. They are a little expensive, but not as, as expensive as fully homomorphic. So to give you some numbers, right? Uh, so speaking of the performance of uh, these schemes, the fully homomorphic encryption, when you take one integer, uh, it, it kind of takes about 2 power 14 bits to store, store that. While we're talking about deterministic encryption, having about 128 bits to store. I mean, we can compare this, right? And uh, the time of operation is like, we're talking microsecond scale in when you, when you uh, use AES as uh, ECB mode versus uh, failure encryption takes about milliseconds and that's pretty much useless. It takes me hours to encrypt a, a, a 100 MB file. <laughs> so the hour uses AES? No, this is AES ECB, okay? This is not even AES. When I say non-deterministic, it's AES-CBC, but they, they also operate at the microsecond scale. 
Okay, that's AES, and this is this is the standard space. So if you're talking about supporting standard encryption algorithms, this is where we are. Anything about this is not standard encryption algorithms as such. Two hundred fifty-six. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Also, in, in case of uh, data administrator, AES, ECB, ECB. The output data size is the same as the input. Ah, uh, no, not necessarily. So the the example that I gave you, I made it specific. I made sure that it's not the same. It looks a little bigger, <laughs> just to make sure that it's actually not the same. So when you say integer is thirty-two bits, total? Yeah, it's thirty-two bits. So thirty-two bits becomes one twenty-eight bits in the case of deterministic encryption. So this is where we are currently. But the but the good part or good news for us is that this space is actually shrinking pretty fast. Pretty pretty fast as in the the time to uh, to to run encryption on FHEs and the amount of space that you need has come down drastically in the past three years. The FH, the HE lib that I just told you about, they are working pretty hard on getting getting it practical. So the data size is a block size then output the same size. So partial size. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. Okay, so that's a that's a interesting question, but it's a corner case situation. So you have a lot of data, you split them into blocks of 128 bit size, and then that last bit of data may have to be padded. Then I understand. But now what we're talking is your your first block itself, which is 128 bits in size. When encrypted, it becomes I mean 32 bits becomes 128 bits. So even the the full fully uh, unpadded 32 bits become 128 bits when encrypted. Okay, so to give a, a, a higher level picture, now we spoke about deterministic encryption, homomorphic encryption, and several encryption schemes. We are talking about trade-offs, right? So if you're talking about partial homomorphic schemes, we're talking about losing a bit of security there, right? We are leaking something, which means if I say order preserving, I know that as a cloud service provider, even he can check what order is my data. Okay, without even looking at the key and other things. I don't have to really authenticate him to actually look into my data and come up with the order. He'll be able to do it. So we're talking trade-offs where we are kind of trying to give up something in order to achieve something, right? For example, uh, in uh, 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 the fully homomorphic encryption that I just spoke about gives you the best functionality. You can do anything you want with the, on the ciphertext. But it's pretty bad in efficiency, right? It's pretty bad in performance. I just told you about how bad the fully homomorphic encryption is. Likewise, in, in terms of security, all these partial homomorphic encryption, it gives away equality checks, you can do order preserving, which means that that's some information about the data. may not be the actual results that you're looking for, but it's still in valuable information about your data, which is being leaked in terms of security in order to achieve some functionality. Right? So these are, these are trade-offs. And each of these trade-offs, will we can quantify them. Like, for example, in functionality's case, I'll be able to check how much part of the queries can be uh, addressed. Like, can I do equality? Can I do Boolean? Can I do range scans? Can I do inner products? Things like that. So the, the best way that we kind of benchmark our uh, level of functionality is we, we, take, we take TPCH. TPCH is pretty popular. We, and there are certain number of uh, types of queries that are possible. For, I mean, to be specific, they have 22 types of queries. So if you take SQL queries on TPCH, there are only 22 different types of queries. Okay, most of them are this repeat of what you can do on that. And certain systems only support two out of the 22, which means you can only perform two of those operations in the ciphertext space, in the, in the encrypted space. Okay, so that's, that's the functionality angle that I'm talking about. So each of, even security and uh, computation, computation of course we can, um, or efficiency, we can, we can check that by just numbers, like how much time does it take for encrypting and decrypting and what's the space it takes. So it's easy to quantify all of these angles. It's not pretty hard. Again, we're not talking theorems and mathematics here. It's pretty much systems. Okay, so, but the big problem is, is encryption equal to security? I'll give, give you a minute to go through that. <laughs> So that's that's the big problem. So this guy says that I need a, a mainframe or whatever is the equivalent to mainframe today 
to crack open your Gmail's password, is that worth it? <laughs> Versus, <laughs> like I can just hold a gun in front of you and then say, give me your password, right? It's, it's like that. So you're, we're talking about uh, provable security versus computationally effective security and things like that. Where is it practical enough to have anything more than 1024, 1000, uh, 1024 bit keys? So we're talking about practical systems. So the, the moment I start speaking to storage practitioners about security, this is the thing, this, is, this comes out of experience. This is not on the slides, but I'm, let, let me tell you how, how it works. When I speak to storage practitioners about security and encryption and all, they don't, so these guys are backup vendors, okay? So they are backup vendors who just take some uh, data, um, uh, data stream, put them in the format that they want, do all sorts of storage efficiency that you want, deduplicate it, compress it, do all sorts of marketing stuff that you can do with it, uh, and then encrypt it, and then store it in cloud, okay? I mean, some, some vendors do that, a lot of vendors do that, actually. Now, I'm, I'm telling, okay, so you're actually doing backup, right? Now, why do you need the, the super duper encryption algorithm, which is not letting you do anything on top of your data? Now, you, you are creating some metadata when you back up, okay? And this metadata is pretty much useless because you've, you, you've just encrypted your entire data. Now, I'm gonna give you some encryption scheme which is not as good in terms of security. We're only talking standard algorithms. We're talking AES CBC versus AES FFX, for example, okay? But this AES FFX is actually giving you so many functionalities for your backup solution that you can search on your backup. I can re restore your backup based on the timestamp inside, let's say, an email box, okay? Mails sent between date uh, 11 and 14 uh, of September 2017. Back, restore only that email. You cannot do that today, but you can do that using my algorithm because I'm using a slightly weaker solution, weaker el encryption algorithm, just because you can gain that functionality. But these guys don't want to talk to you just because you just said weak encryption algorithm. They don't want, they are, they're paranoid about the fact that, oh, weak encryption, which means that people can crack into my thing. No, it's AES alg algorithm at the end of the day. So that's the, that's the big experience that I got from talking to many guys where they say, no, I don't want to give up on security, not even a tiny bit, okay? I want the same security that I'm using. I don't care about your functionality. So that, that mentality doesn't seem to change at all. Uh, but but as, as we know, encryption is not the only security thing. There are so many layers of it, access control, authentication, so many other things other than just this. Okay, so going into the specifics, right? So uh, this is more of, so whatever I covered so far is more of, 11.25, I have 10 minutes, I, I, I might have to rush through a bit, but it's okay. So we just covered the entire space. Th these are a little bit more specifics, like what are the uh, objects that leak? Okay, so I can, I can leak information about the queries, I can leak information about the actual data itself. Yeah, thank you. And I can, I can leak information about the queries response. Okay, so uh, I'll, so th th that's about the object that leaks. What is the type of information that you leak? Is it the actual data? Is it the order? Is it equality? Or what is the type of information you leak? And which operation leaks? What is the operation that you're doing? So are you doing select uh, star from employee database where employee name is equal to some name? So that's equal to some name, right? And you're probably gonna have a proxy which encrypts that name into some ciphertext and then look up for something. So that equality is the is the uh, operation that's leak, leaks information. And party that learns from the leakage. Is it the cloud service provider? Is it the proxy? Is it an attacker? Is it a honest but curious admin who's sitting there? I don't know. Okay, so who is the person who, so that's a threat model that we'll have to evolve. It's not a, it's not an easy job there at the, at the, at the end. Okay, so information leaked by the objects. So what is the kind of information that, that is leaked by the object? So I kind of characterize by, uh, uh, not much to a lot, <laughs> a lot of information. So if you say, if the structure is leaked about the data, it's not much, it's okay, it's, it's only the structure of the data. But if you're giving away order of the data, that's, in a, that's important information, okay? If it's equality, that's a lot of information, but still not as bad as order, okay? So you don't have to go through the whole right-hand side, it's just examples, but if you have to implement a, a searchable encryption technique, we'll have to understand in that particular system, what, are, what is the kind of information that is leaked? And am I super sensitive about leaking the order of that data? Then you should probably not use this thing at all, okay? So it's about, on a case-to-case -case basis, we'll have to understand which one of your data is important from what angle, and then what algorithm can I use there? It's, there's no one, 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 one system fits all kind of a situation here. We'll have to architect it based on the needs of a customer or 
or the end user. Uh, okay, and it also depends on the type of data. Is it structured data? Because if I'm talking structured data, I know there are going to be structured queries coming to me. Because if I'm, if I'm storing data in MySQL, I know it's going to be SQL semantics that's coming to me. But if I'm talking about unstructured data, I mean, what are, what are you searching for? I have no clue. Is it going to be probably Boolean equality, some bit of structure to the queries that is coming in, but it's not as super structured as the structured information, right? Like JSONs and XMLs and your SQL databases, we know that the queries will have to abide by certain semantics and certain, certain syntax. Uh, and, and I know that if there is select uh, um, uh, average of salary from an employee database, I know that average is a is a aggregate function. I, I'll, will I be able to perform that aggregate function on the ciphertext space? I'll be able to understand that I can parse the query. I can find out if those queries contain in, contain um, functions that can be done on the encrypted space. But if there is no structure to it, what can I do? I can't do anything. So that is the reason. So I gave you that example of me trying to impl implement Elasticsearch on, on, uh, on the searchable encryption techniques, right? The reason behind venturing into that was this is a beaten space. Uh, MIT CSAIL lab was uh, developing CryptDB back in 2009. Okay, they started in 2007, the project started in 2007. So it's about 10 year old technology. People have been looking at structured databases forever on trying to get that encrypted. But not many people have looked into the unstructured space of the how, how to store encrypted data and still understand information. So what if I use Elasticsearch, store the data, have indices all encrypted, indices encrypted, data encrypted, and how can I query on that? Because the query is not going to have any syntax or semantics there. So I was venturing into this space, but not much, much of this. Okay, and you can have mixed queries as well. Um, yeah, so the, the, the one... Yeah, the one, again, takeaway, I mean, I'm, I'm not getting into specifics. This kind of gives you a summary of how much, uh, a, a summary of the time I spent on this space. So I understood that um, if you take any query on encrypted data or even normal data, let's say unencrypted, regular SQL um, uh, databases, I understood that you take all fancy queries that you have, you can break them down into something called as base queries. These are the maximum possible base operations that you can, like in homomorphic encryption, you can do only addition and multiplication, I said, right? So if anything more than that, we can always, we can always put addition and multiplication together and construct something bigger. Likewise, I understood that there are only certain two or three base queries, and any other bigger query is just a composition of these base queries. And uh, essentially, these base queries are equality, order and Boolean queries. Those are the three things. You can do equality, order, and base queries. And it's all a mix and match of this. So a select star from whatever, whatever, group by what? Group by, it's again a pop, a, 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 a fancy way of doing order, order by. Okay. So things like that. So it's, it's essentially base queries and some compost queries. This is not what I'm going to go through. But still, compost queries, what I'm trying to do is take a compost query. So if you read, I'm starting with equality, basic equality, which already is a base query, right? I'm going all the way to a wildcard or a substring search, which is equal to a regex, right? So regex essentially is you have any kind of wildcard pattern you want, A star, B star, C question mark, whatever, right? Now that is a perfectly unstructured query. I don't have a syntax. I don't have a, a, a perfect way of writing regex. And anybody can come up with a regex in, the, in a way they want. Now, will I be able to translate that regex into an encrypted fashion so that people can do regex on encrypted data? So that was the direction I was headed to. And the answer is yes, you can do it. Okay, it's not, It doesn't have to be super structured as SQL. You can have unstructured regexes and you can do similar uh, ciphertext, I mean, uh, encrypted searches on uh, regexes. But there is a caveat. <laughs> okay, that is again a lesson learned. It's that if I know what is the regex that I'm going to do, on the data that's encrypted, I will encrypt my data accordingly. Okay, so that's the caveat. It's not that any any regex is possible. It's not that any regex on pre-encrypted data is possible. I will encrypt it in a way so that I can support that regex. Okay, that's that's the caveat. But yeah, it's possible. So giving you a, a landscape, uh, as I told you, um, you can have secure location versus homomorphic encryption schemes. That is, you have the data encrypted in cloud and perform computation on encrypted data, that is y-axis, versus 
you move the data to a secure location, decrypt it, and perform the computation and discard the data. That is moving to a trusted domain. Okay. So if I put that, if I plot that across uh, x-axis and y-axis, there are not many systems in the fully homomorphic space. As I told you, the, F, the HE lib, the library for fully homomorphic encryption, is still in development, and they haven't gotten to uh, any systems implementations yet. But the partial and the non-homomorphic encryption schemes, they do have some, some implementation. These, uh, anyway, the slides will be available. Right, they help you uh, speed up. Of course, they help you speed up uh, AES's uh, um, performance. But this, uh, it, it, it may speed up our performance of the overarching application, which essentially is a database. But uh, they don't give you additional functionality. AES is still AES. Whatever you can do with AES is what you can do. It may just be faster. Oh, no, no, no. That is, so there's a, there's a good, good, I mean, it's a beautiful question because AES NI is a class of instructions that is uh, exposed to you just to have speed up in your AES. Likewise, there are other things like AES, um, I forget the name, uh, other instruction sets which uh, speed up things like Galois field arithmetic and things like uh, advanced math functions which are being done faster. Now, there are open source libraries on top of it like uh, Intel's ISAL, Intel's Intelligent Storage Acceleration Library, which is a library on top of these instruction set, which can actually give you an API for a, uh, for, a, uh, for a storage developer who can use this so that you can use these underlying faster uh, instructions. So there are things available on that space, but uh, for homomorphic, most of them are useless. Most of what's currently available is useless. And look at it, it's not like that this kind of Because of the security and the design that you make. If you're saying they want to look for keyword, but I'm not going to say what keyword is, then you cannot just go to your list and, and say, okay, I order my list, and I only look between letter C and D, because then you're somehow saying already to the server everything before in this list does not match my keyword, everything behind it does not match my keyword, and so the server learns this about your, your keyword. Because between C and D. Right. So you practically to hide what you're doing, you have to go through everything, or you have to do as much work as possible. Right. Right. And this, is, and this is the trade-off you have to make. You can right. do it very, very fast, but then basically you're saying RGB item 300, and the server will know that it was item 300. Or you say, give me some obscure item, I'm not going to tell you what. And then, if you think about it, the server has to touch every item without knowing which is the one that is actually returning to you. Right. Was the ORAM that you... ORAM, yeah. I didn't, I didn't mention and about it. And it really needs to, to touch everything on the, on the disk all the terabytes that it has, because it should not know what it can return. So right. that, that's a, that's a, a trade-off you always have to make. Right. And these things they try to make. Right, that's right, that's right. So to, to give a very dumb example of ORAM, because you mentioned about ORAM, uh, it's something like this. So I look for Trump, okay? Let's say I'm searching for Trump uh, in Google. So now, Google is not going to give me about Donald Trump. It's going to give me about Melania Trump and whoever, okay, all of Trump's family. Now, even if I search for Donald Trump, it's now going to give me answers about Melania Trump and everybody and, and so on and so forth, okay. Now, what, what did I search for? Did I search for Donald Trump or something else, according to an attacker? He doesn't know, okay. It looks like I searched for Trump, but actually I, looked, I, I did search for Donald Trump. Do you get it? So I ask for something. But the server responds with a lot more than what I asked for. That way, a person in the middle doesn't know what you actually searched for. Okay, so that's ORAM for you. But inherently, the scheme goes by the technique that it's going to return a lot more than what you asked for, which, is, which means performance is going for a toss. So all of these schemes, performance is kind of taken for granted that it's going to be lesser than your usual thing. If you compare AES with, let's say, the fastest FHE that may be possible in, let's say, two years from now, it will be slower because of the inherent mechanism of FHE. I mean, I'm just trying to supplement this answer, but that's a, that's a great point. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I'm, I'm almost done, but I just wanted to highlight two systems that have implemented uh, 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 searchable encryption schemes. One is ScriptDB, which I mentioned about in the MITC sales work from 2007. 
so essentially what they did was uh, they did uh, what's called as R&D is the AES CBC equivalent where you enter with the, the, the most complicated encryption algorithm in terms of security but you can do nothing with it versus you can do deterministic and order preserving and all. And uh, they had uh, something like a, a client and a proxy and a server. So the proxy will get your data, encrypt it, manage the keys and store it in the server. And when you have to query, it will translate your query for the sake of uh, 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 querying the encrypted data. When the results come back, it decrypts for you and gives it back. Okay, so the proxy is kind of sitting in the middle with the keys and other stuff and it gets all this translation done for you both in queries and, uh, and, uh, and data and results. Uh, Monomy is something where you do part of your work at the client, part of your work at the server. So something that is super sensitive will be done at the client. Something that's not so sensitive will be done at the, uh, at the server. They use some functional encryption where you, you expose only non-sensitive stuff to the server and you get that part done so that computationally you are not overburdened with the client. You get the results back and you do furthermore, uh, uh, furthermore or analytics or, or querying on top of it and then you get the actual results out. That's Monomi. And, and these are the most popular and the most uh, uh, established uh, encryption algorithm schemes. So to conclude, I, I gave a pretty good insight into the space. Um, for, for, but, but, but the key takeaway is that encryption is not all about it, it, security is not all about encryption. Okay? It, it's only a part of it. So we're talking about application security and DBMS or databases in general is just one part of the stack. There are a lot of weekends, okay? A lot of people say that I use TLS for the channel. I use uh, 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 disk encryption, full disk encryption or S3 encryption for the data at store. But what happens in the middle? What happens at the application stack? What happens at the operating system? What happens at the cloud service provider? Nobody speaks about it. So we'll have to talk about security holistically and not at places like databases and application and in the channel and things like that. So that's still an immature conversation. Uh, in terms of usability, uh, we need to come up with tools and understand the need of a, a, a system or a customer or a use case and then model this whole searchable encryption accordingly. It's not like, a, as I told, one size fits all solution. And, um, and of course, these have connections to different areas of security and different areas of storages, but we'll have to have a conversation for that. Yeah, that's pretty much it. And uh, questions, I think I can take one. If not, thank you for being a patient audience. Uh, I'll be around for the, all, for the entire conference. You can catch me. Thank you.